Mercy. Thank you. That was so sweet. What's up, San Diego? <laughs> oh, my God. Help us all, Jesus. <laughs> I don't know how I got here. Let me just pull out my paperwork here. I'm going to take this off. I'm hot, I'm cold, I'm hot, I'm cold. I don't know what's happening. All right, so I'm in between sizes. <laughs> Nothing I'm wearing fits <laughs> right now. I just dropped 10 pounds. And then I carved up before this. <laughs> it was a long drive from LA. All right. How much time, first of all, do I have, John? What time do I have to stop? Let's say that. I can see the clock right there. What time should I stop? All right, good. Okay. <laughs> all right, okay. Cough up the bucks. Okay. <laughs> oh, my goodness. So actually, it was 20 years ago, not 25, which is okay. Um, because it was like 1999 was the first time that I came to, at that time, Pacific Church from, uh, <laughs> I won't tell that story again about Park Manor Suites and basically doing both the Sunday services drunk. But that is what happened. <laughs> Uh -huh. So, but I'm sober today, so that's okay. I mean, I don't mean I'm a sober person, I mean I'm sober right now. <laughs> I keep looking at these notes like there's something there to help us. There isn't really anything to help us. Okay, so, this has been I know it's only two months into this year, but it's already been the best year of my life so far. And I really claim that for you as well, even though nothing has happened. <laughs> so if you're waiting for big news, there's no big news. It's just the best year of my life so far. In fact, in 2016, when I was lecturing here, I think I was lecturing here still like every Wednesday night because my birthday is on July 1st, and so I know it was the Wednesday of that week in 2016 when people were getting all upset about politics. And I said, and there were people who were, well, if this happens, it's just gonna be the worst four years of da 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 da. And I was like, well, then what the fuck are you doing here? <laughs> if that's what you believe, if that's your philosophy, what are you doing in New Thought? Head over to, to Catholic Church. <laughs> That's where I was raised, where it's okay to practice suffering <laughs> as a spiritual practice. <laughs> I did that for years. <laughs> so I declared right then, this will be the best four years of my life so far. And so the two years in were the best two years. And then once that was, then I said, well, I'm going to make the next two years even better than those two years. Those of you who are familiar with Louise Hay, who for many years lived here in San Diego. In fact, I had breakfast over at Jimmy Carter's over in Hillcrest, and you know, Louise's place, she had that big penthouse right there overlooking Balboa Park, and I was thinking, who has that penthouse? <laughs> who got the penthouse? Uh, but she used to say, every, and she would say, certainly at the beginning of every decade, she would say, this is going to be the best decade of my life so far. So she said that at 70 and at 80 and at 90, because that's how it works. You are the author of your life. You are creating your own reality through your words. That's what this whole philosophy is based on. Ernest Holmes said over and over again, nobody believes more in prayer than we do, and the entire philosophy is rooted in prayer. Everything about science of the mind is rooted in prayer, and that your word is law. You are creating from what you are saying, what you are thinking. It is done unto you as you believe. 
not as you wish or hope. It is done unto you as you believe. And so that's all we're ever working on all the time is our consciousness. So that's why I say it's been the best year of my life so far is because I just keep working on my consciousness. We're not working on things out here. We're not trying to fix the world. A Course in Miracles says, seek not to change the world, but choose to change your mind about the world. That's why Jesus refused to start a social or political movement. He was pushed to do it all the time and said, that's not your problem. Your problem is your thinking. The problem has nothing to do with politics, has nothing to do with the environment. People were just as neurotic then. <laughs> really, still freaked out about what to eat, just like we are now. <laughs> oh, I don't know, there's chemicals, there's this, there's that. Blah, blah, blah. Back then it was just, is it holy, is it unholy, is it clean or is it unclean? And Jesus said, that's not what's up, that, that has nothing to do with it. He said, it's not what you're putting in your mouth that's the problem. What's defiling you is what's coming out of your mouth. So watch what you're saying. Watch how you're complaining and bitching. That's your reality. The more you focus on something, the more of it you have in your life and in your experience. What you are focused on, you are literally seeing. That's it. That's it. We exist in these bodies, but we live in our imagination. Your life is all in your imagination. You know that. It's just the story you're telling all day long. <laughs> the question is, is it a good story or does it suck? <laughs> because you're telling it. You're the one telling it. Tell a better story if you don't like the story. I remember years ago reading in that book of Carrie Fisher's Postcards from the Edge where the lead character who was sort of a takeoff of her said, I narrate a life I'm reluctant to lead. That means you're narrating your life all the time. You're the narrator in your head of now I'm doing this, now I'm going here, now I'm this, now I'm that, now I'm over here, now I'm going over there. You're just, you're narrating it. Is it pitiful? <laughs> or are you narrating something interesting? Everywhere I go, people love me. <laughs> I'm the guest star everywhere I go. Right? Life loves me. That was one of Louise's, life loves me. She would say life instead of God because Louise was trained in religious science. She went through all of the practitioner classes and she was a religious science minister. And that wonderful, really classic book of Ernest Holmes, The Art of Life, that's, he doesn't talk about God, he talks about life. The word God is not used that much. And I think that's really helpful in so many ways because when we say God, that ancient part of the brain thinks of some dude out there. He's going to do shit. <laughs> or he won't do shit. <laughs> right? <laughs> so Ernest Holmes in that book called it life. Right? That life is doing this. So Louise always, almost never said God. She always said, life loves me. Life is revealing to me. Life is bringing to me what is in my best interest. All of that. That life. That you are actively participating with this presence and this principle. And so that's where I came in. I came in here as a student in the 1980s, probably like 1980, 1983 in like January, I think. Maybe it was 84 in January where I first went to see Terry Cole Whitaker uh, at the El Cortez. And she was not only teaching religious science at that time, but she was teaching Course in Miracles. So that's always been my foundation, is the teachings of religious science and A Course in Miracles. And so everything that I teach comes from that. I had lunch this week with a friend uh, in Los Angeles where I live, someone that I had met through when I was filling in for uh, Marianne Williamson for a while. And so I met a bunch of, because I don't really, I live in an undisclosed location <laughs> in a secret society <laughs> in the Mystic Protection Program. <laughs> <laughs> like three people in the world have my phone number. I'm just like, I lay low, okay? 
So, so I did end up meeting a bunch of people when I was filling in for Mary Ann. And so we've had lunch before, and I hadn't seen her in a couple of years, and we had lunch, and it was great. It was, she's, I love her. She's a delight. We had a good time. But she was talking about inviting me to things, and this meditation thing, and this maybe we'll go see this teacher and all of this stuff. And I realized that I've had that experience for years, where I remember when I was here, when I first moved uh, back to San Diego in like 2000, and I was doing the Wednesday night services at uh, Pacific Church. And I remember meeting people then, and the th thing mostly that people wanted to do with me were spiritual things. So they'd be like, oh, come to our metaphysical book study, or come to our da-da-da-da. And I was like, that's like inviting a lawyer to a law class. <laughs> Like, I'm not looking for more work-oriented things. I'm looking for, do you know, of a good party or something to go to. But people would always want to invite me to these spiritual things. And, and so here was this woman, she was inviting me to these spiritual things. And I realized, oh, she thinks I'm a seeker like her. That I'm a spiritual seeker. But I'm not a spiritual seeker. I stopped seeking many, many, many decades ago. When you find, stop seeking. Seeking becomes an end in itself. A Course in Miracles, there's a line in A Course in Miracles that says, the ego mind encourages you to seek as long as you don't find. It says, therefore, its motto can be summed up as seek, but do not find. <laughs> So that you're always just looking, looking, looking. When you find, what happened was I found, so I married that. And then I stopped dating around. <laughs> That's what you should do when you marry. Stop dating around. <laughs> Some people don't know that. <laughs> it's a good idea. You should call off the search. <laughs> Just <I'm> done. <laughs> There's that famous scripture, Matthew 7. 7 says, Seek and ye shall find, knock and the door shall be opened, ask and it shall be given. But it doesn't tell you what to do after that. What? Okay, so you seek and you find, then what? Then you stop. When the door is open, walk inside. When I found, I just stopped. So in many ways, my life is about stillness. I'm just still. I don't run around a lot. My career is very different than most people who do this kind of thing. Most people who do what I do travel around, go from place to place to place. Unless you're the minister of a church, if you're a teacher, you do workshops and you travel around and you're on the road the vast majority of the time. And I never go anywhere. <laughs> I never leave Southern California. When I go to Santa Barbara, I'm like there at the verge of the Central Coast, <laughs> feeling like this might be too far. <laughs> Going from <laughs> Because frankly, I wanted to come to California all the years I grew up in Pennsylvania, when I got here, I was like, I'm done. <laughs> when you find, stop. I couldn't imagine, why would anyone leave Southern California? <laughs> I don't understand that. So for almost 18 years, I never took a plane. From like 2001 until last year, I never went anywhere until a friend took me to Venice, Italy for Carnival last year. That was the first time I'd been out of town <laughs> in all that time. Now next month, he's taking me to Maui. Now I consider that a spiritual retreat at the Ritz Carlton. Because <laughs> that is how I do spiritual retreat. <laughs> Someone said, oh, you could go see Ram Dass. I'm like, I've seen Ram Dass. I want to see the massage table at the Ritz Carlton. <laughs> I'm starting a, I do these 12 week boot camps, and we just ended one that was a prosperity boot camp. And they're just the 
weekly recordings that I send out, and then I have like a private Facebook group where people can check in every day and there are things I write there. But they have this theme, so the one that we just finished was prosperity, and now we're starting another one tomorrow, which is an inner peace and joy boot camp. Because it seems to me like that's really what people need right now. Because people don't realize that they are torturing themselves. They think a president is torturing them. They don't know they're doing it. The, the essence, as many of you know who've come to hear me speak so many times, is the essence of metaphysics is very simple. It's boiled down to just one movie. The calls are coming from inside the house. <laughs> That's all you. All that stuff you think is them, that's all you. That's all your projection and your story. That's you doing that to you. People who get up every morning to see what there is to be upset about. Now what's he done? What have they done? Right? That's you. That's why A Course in Miracles was such a revelation to me when I started reading it is because the entire purpose of the Course is the attainment of inner peace. Uh, and people will say, oh, the Course is about love, or the Course is about forgiveness, or the Course is about this or that. It is not, really. It is about the attainment of inner peace. All of those things are a path to inner peace. But the Course itself, and if you ever get confused, just look to see who publishes it. The Foundation for Inner Peace. <laughs> publishes a book on inner peace. And what that big book tells you is what really basically most metaphysics tells you, which is that it's all happening in your own mind. All of the torture, all of the pain. And that was so important for me to learn because a lot of what brought me to metaphysics to begin with was that I had had such enormous anxiety growing up. I had panic attacks and anxiety and all those things before it was trendy. <laughs> this was back in the 1960s in rural Pennsylvania. And we had a family history of anxiety. Nobody, like, people didn't even use that word, really, in the 1960s. I remember that when my mother would have an anxiety attack, my father would say, your mother's having one of her fits. <laughs> <laughs> she couldn't catch her breath. She would have, that would be how her panic would go, your mother's having one of her fits. So he would give her a little shot of whiskey and then she was okay. <laughs> this was a still a little before we knew about pills. <laughs> so. hmm. But to me, like Louise, Louise always said, I'm a very simple person. Life is very simple. And the longer that I'm doing this, the simpler I become. The simpler and simpler I become. The issue, I think, and where people get really lost is the longer they stay in this, the more they tend to get complicated and add in a lot of what I like to call bullshit. <laughs> bullshit! <laughs> Working with your shadow and digging up stuff. Bullshit! <laughs> your shadow disappears in the light. Keep it as simple as you possibly can. That's why Louise always said, it's just a thought, and a thought can be changed. It's just a thought, and a thought can be changed. I want to read a little bit from this Ernest Holmes book that I have a Harry Potter sticker on. Because <laughs> I live in a magical realm Behind the mists, over the moat, past the troll, in the secret society of the Mystic Protection Program. <laughs> so in this book, I used to, you know, I say here all the time, all my favorite authors are the dead ones. <laughs> I really prefer all the dead ones. The contemporary <laughs> metaphysical authors do nothing for me. So it's usually all of the dead ones. And when I used to lecture here all the time, like this book, this book, Ernest Holmes Seminar Lectures, is actually from Asilomar. So they took all of these talks from this week at Asilomar and turned them into this little book. And oh my god, 
Patty, <laughs> when Patty was running the bookstore at Pacific Church, all the books that I would recommend, she'd go, it's out of print. <laughs> I know, they're dead. <laughs> All these dead people's books. <laughs> so, you can probably get this on Amazon, but it's probably $200 because there's probably only two copies of it. <laughs> but I love this, this little story here. This is in his talk on your past and future is now. But, and I love this line. I think more and more there is no such thing as heart trouble. There is only a troubled heart. There's no such thing as heart trouble. There's just a troubled heart. Ernest Holmes talked about how back of every organ, back of every physical thing, is a divine mental pattern. So all that prayer does, our prayer treatment, is realign you with the perfect divine pattern in back of the physical thing, so the, the heart. In back of what we would call a defect of the heart, is the perfect divine pattern of that heart. So since we know everything is mental, he's saying there's no such thing really as heart trouble, just a troubled heart. Just a troubled heart. Uh, of Course in Miracles, there's a psychotherapy handbooklet that says something along the lines of, all illness is mental illness. All illness is mental illness in that it's just a realignment of thought that needs to take place. Don't you love that? There's no heart trouble, there's just a troubled heart. And we've got to stop thinking of the physical thing, focusing on fixing the physical thing. Do you know there's no such thing as a physical thing, really? It's just an expression of consciousness. A Course in Miracles says everything's an illusion. So Ernest Holmes just said, eh, things are as real as they need to be. <laughs> he said, I don't know if they're an illusion or not, but things are as real as they need to be. And they're a reflection of consciousness. So what I love when the Course in Miracles says, well, it's all an illusion, and Joel Goldsmith says basically the same thing. Christian science says basically the same thing, right? That there's nothing that exists that God didn't make, and God didn't make anything imperfect. Therefore, anything that looks imperfect is just what Jesus called an appearance. Judge not according to the appearance of illness, the appearance of poverty, the appearance of. Stop trying to fix it. Joel Goldsmith talked about it like trying to make a mirage go away. You see a mirage on the road and go, how are we going to get rid of the mirage? What are we going to do about this mirage? Somebody needs to help us because this mirage is blocking our way. You don't do anything about a mirage except know that it is a mirage. This is why always early on, before we got sophisticated and were worried about hurting people's feelings, this is what fucking ruined new thought, by the way. <laughs> you understand? We start worrying about people's feelings. Understanding that law is no respecter of persons and law is ruthless. Laws are ruthless. Gravity doesn't care that you're a baby when you crawl off the roof. It is ruthless. It doesn't think, well, he doesn't know. It's like, doesn't matter, <laughs> right? Ignorance of the law <laughs> doesn't really matter. So, <laughs> sometimes I think, should I go on? Is it enough? Just make your apologies, get in the car, go. So, <laughs> So Ernest Holmes, you know, and all this is saying, stop focusing on the disease. Stop focusing on the condition. Stop focusing on the homelessness. Stop focusing on the appearance of the condition and go to the cause. And the cause is always consciousness, whether it's our individual consciousness or the human race consciousness. That is the only thing that needs healing. 
the only thing that needs healing. That's why Ernest Holmes would say, as he says in one of the stories in this little book, oh, it's no problem. We will just reverse the mental pattern. We just reverse the mental pattern. Right? The thought of poverty is a mental pattern. You reverse it with a thought of abundance and prosperity. You reverse the mental pattern. The way you neutralize a thought is by using an opposing thought. I am poor just becomes I am abundant. So simple. But as A Course in Miracles says, simplicity is difficult for twisted minds. <laughs> We like it to be complicated. We like it to be difficult. Can't you make this harder? <laughs> People in various ways ask me that. Can't you make this harder? I mean, I'm not doing the little bit you are asking me, but can't you ask more? <laughs> what is wrong with people? So you, you begin to think, I've got to stop focusing my attention on this problem, this issue, this thing, knowing that in reality it doesn't even really exist. Only perfection exists. Only perfection exists. I only see the perfection. Yes, there is an appearance, and we can work with the appearance. We're not talking about denying it. We're not talking about don't go to the doctor or don't go to the accountant or I'm not talking about that kind of negative suppressing something because you're afraid of it and you don't want to look at it. We're talking about having a greater truth in your mind while you're doing whatever you're guided to do, having acupuncture or going to the doctor or the body work or whatever it is that you're doing. It's not about, this is not Christian science where we, that's what I love. Ernest Holmes says, we believe in anything that works, right? And I love a good pill. <laughs> so I, nothing, it's not about that. <laughs> but it's what you're thinking when you're taking the pill. It's what's your level of consciousness with that. One of the things, I was talking about this, I had been trying for a while to lose weight, which is one sure way to gain weight to try to lose weight. <laughs> so I kept having all these programs, I'll do this, I'll do this, I'll do this, and I lose two or three pounds and then gain two or three pounds, and I couldn't get anywhere until I heard one of my lectures. <laughs> and I was, oh, that's, that's such a great idea. <laughs> Who is that guy? <laughs> that's some good stuff. And I realized that I've been believing bullshit. We just hear just enough information to fuck shit up, <laughs> right? Just a little bit of, all you really need is like, just to do a quick pass through of five minutes of Susie Orman on PBS. <laughs> and the next thing you know, all you can see is yourself eating cat food out of a dumpster. <laughs> <laughs> You've given away all your metaphysical training and study and... Because we're so suggestible. We are so wildly suggestible. And so I, <clears throat> I'd been seeing things and reading things. You know, you just get little hits of this, that, and the other thing, a little thing on YouTube, a little thing in an article or something or other. And I started thinking, have, buying into these facts that are not true. So things like, well, your metabolism slows down after a certain age. And then you have a sluggish metabolism. And then if you've dieted a lot off and on, you may now have a broken metabolism. <laughs> right? This is the new thing they have. You have a broken metabolism. And then they talk about how you can repair your broken metabolism. And da, da, da. So in all these things going, I was starting to deal with all these things and think, what should I do? And do I really believe that? And I can affirm over that so that I can heal my metabolism. I have a fast metabolism. And then one day it occurred to me, Jacob, there's no fucking such thing as a metabolism. <laughs> do you understand that? 
that in principle, there is no such thing as a metabolism. You're trying to fix something that does not exist. There's a section in the workbook of the Course in Miracles that goes each day sort of progressively of, where it basically gets to, let me recognize that all my problems have been solved. But mostly what we do is get up every morning and start working really hard on the non-existent problem. I've got to spend all day working on this illusory problem that I've been working on for decades now. <laughs> so really, there's no problem. Like I, for a while I thought about, because my family is sick, sick, <laughs> sick genetics, okay? And this was very disturbing to me until I realized there's no such thing as genetics or DNA. They're just stories. They're just stories in the factual level of illusory appearances. Just between my mother and father, then almost every disease known to sort of the American culture. Just all the hit list. My mother had diabetes, heart disease, had a pacemaker, cancer, radical mastectomy, bleeding psoriasis, depression, inner ear, problem and imbalance. My father had heart disease, high blood pressure. By the time I was born, both of them had full upper and lower dentures in their 30s. I know, right? So seriously, when I go to the doctors and you fill out those forms, I just lie. I'm not checking all this stuff off. They just start to dig my grave. Because they just assume, they project onto you, you're going to get all this because that's, it's all genetic and it's all da 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 da. And honestly, I shouldn't, I'm not suggesting this for anyone else, okay? But I don't have a doctor. I haven't been to the doctor in years. I don't look for trouble. <laughs> if something happens, I go. I have no problem with that, but I don't just go just to see. Go to see. Because <laughs> right? that's what you're supposed to do now. You're supposed to go to see. You're over 40. We would like to look up your butt. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> you're going to have to buy me a condo for that, okay? And I'm not just going to let you go. Cut my butt for no reason. I'm not interested in that whole dating experience with you, doctor. <laughs> Again, I'm not suggesting that for anybody, but as far as I know, I'm perfectly healthy because I haven't asked an expert. So I'm not on any medication. I'm not, I feel pretty great. So I may have 18 deadly diseases and die before this lecture's over, but I will die happy believing I was healthy. I, <clears throat> I go up to Santa Barbara once a month to lecture, and um, I go up on a Tuesday. I went for years and years and years on Saturdays, and one of the things that has made this such a wonderful time in my life is because I'm always just, I'm just in stillness studying the same thing, and I'm as excited about it now as I was the first day I picked it up decades ago, 30-some years ago. But I read the same books over and over and over and over and over again. Sometimes, and I highlight the shit out of them. So sometimes I just highlight them, highlight them, highlight them, and then I donate them and rebuy it. <laughs> Start over again, you know? <clears throat> so one of the things was I had gotten really, um, Santa Barbara was sort of dying off because a lot of the people, I'd been lecturing there longer than anywhere since 1990, and we weren't really bringing in new people, and so people were dying off of old age, basically. I was like, I'm just watching them die here, and this is less fun than you can imagine. <laughs> <laughs> like, they're, they're really, like, people up in their 80s, like, when they're not there, it's like, oh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so what I, one of the things that I realized was, that I was just going. You know, sometimes you're just doing things. Don't do that. 
don't just do things. You have to do things because you have some passionate reason to do them. But I had just always gone, and they had wanted me to go, and so I went. And I couldn't think of any real reason not to go. But there was nothing really drawing me there anymore. It was kind of a sense of loyalty. And mostly, I talked about this when I was lecturing here, like weekly, about how when you get to a certain age, a lot of times, well, one of the, the uh, lessons in the workbook of A Course in Miracles is, I see only the past. But the longer you live, the more that kind of becomes true for you, and especially if you're in the same places all the time, where you don't really see that much new because you're just looking through the filter of your past memories. Oh, there's where so-and-so lived. Oh, that's when I used to do that, and I used to go here, and this used to be. And especially places like Santa Barbara, if I was only going once a month, and I hadn't lived there in years, all I really saw was the past. Oh, there's so-and-so, he's dead now of AIDS, there's so-and-so, we had that horrible fight there, there's that place. So I just saw the past. And what I realized was, again, I heard one of my talks. <laughs> so you have to, right up to the day you die, be creating new memories. And this has to be a goal and a purpose in your life, is to create new memories. A lot of times this is why people get addicted to traveling and vacations, is because they're seeing new things all the time and they're bored with where they are. But it's really just a mindset where you are. So I had to shift my consciousness to say, I either have to stop going to Santa Barbara or I have to start creating new memories and have a new intention. Don't do anything without an intention for it. Everything should have a purpose and an intention. So I was just going to Santa Barbara, so it was no surprise that it wasn't growing or changing in any way, because I didn't have an intention for growth or newness. So once I realized, well, we should bring in some younger people, like people in their 50s. <laughs> like a youth movement. That's how I felt. It's like, get those young 50-year-olds in here. <laughs> right? Because that's because I'm like 58, so that's 50. Oh my God, bring those 50-year-olds in. They're so full of life. <laughs> but one of the things I realized was, well, you can't do this on Saturday mornings then. You've got to do a weeknight. Because the younger people are, who work all week, Saturday mornings, they're doing all their errands and their laundry and their this and their that. And one of the reasons we had done the Saturday mornings was because the old people wouldn't drive at night. But the young people won't come on the weekends. So we said, well, we don't have that many old people left, so it's fine, we'll just go to the weeknights and the younger people will come out. Well, what that did was then I was able to spend more time in Santa Barbara because I'm not just going up first thing in the morning before anything's open, because I, I leave immediately after my speaking engagements to get, because I want to beat all the traffic and everything. So I wasn't seeing anything in Santa Barbara. I was just going in, giving the talk, and leaving. So now I go up Tuesday afternoons and I go to a very nice restaurant in Montecito. I have a nice glass of wine, a little bit of pasta, and then I still have a couple of hours before class starts. So it's very nice. So I started then going around the town and having new experiences and seeing new places. And I sent a, uh, there's an old friend of mine who I haven't seen in many years who lives in Montecito, not far from the restaurant where I eat. So I took a picture of myself in the restaurant and sent it to her while I was there and said, I'm in Montecito and I'm teaching on Tuesday nights now and I just wanted to say hello and blah, blah, blah. So she emailed me back right away and she said, and she hadn't seen me in years, and she said, you look so healthy and so real. And I was like, I know, I lost my hair and got fat. Okay, I understand what you're saying. I got old, it's been 30 years, okay, I understand. <laughs> You look so real. <laughs> but she meant it in a wonderful way. And I, I took it in a wonderful way because there, there's very little that's as real as I am. There's just, I just don't have time for a lot of foolishness and phoniness and pretense. To me, because I came into this with somebody who was as authentic and real as Terry, who really didn't hide anything, that was like the only thing that probably 
got me to think that I could do this, was I didn't have to be something else. I remember doing a radio interview here in San Diego, kind of near the end, where the press were kind of on her case and not very nice to her at times. And she got onto this radio show, and the guy said to her, tell the truth, Terry, are you a phony? And she said, sometimes. <laughs> I was like, I love that. <laughs> Isn't that true? Like every now and then, how are you? Fine. <laughs> but it's that sense of when you find what you're looking for, you can stop searching and know that you don't have to do anything anymore. You don't have to do anything anymore. You are sufficient. You are enough. You don't need your act anymore. You don't have to pretend anymore. You can be so real and know that some people will like it and some people won't. How awesome. That was Terry's book, right? What you think of me is none of my business. That you're not worried about trying to impress anybody. That I'm not trying to get followers. I have no marketing. I'm not a brand. It horrifies me that people think they're a brand. Branding is what we do to cattle with a hot poker. <laughs> You are not a fucking brand. Stop telling people you're a brand. That's a horrible thing to be. Talk about limiting yourself, because then you might be off brand. I wanted to have fun, but it's off brand. <laughs> All right. So today's about joy. Let's try and have some. So he's telling us in this story about the story of the prodigal son. This is our trouble, and I doubt not that all of our disease, all of our accidents, all of hell as we conceive it, and everything that denies the truth is merely, re merely the result of the inability of the individual and the group of individuals to let the dead bury their dead and step forward into the evolutionary process to carry nothing forward that inhibits the new viewpoint. So he's talking about, in this whole thing, dropping your corpse. Yeah. Dropping the corpse. Let the dead bury the dead. To me, you know, a lot of people talk about the, the greatest movie ever is Citizen Kane. And I think what is really great about that movie is that it is such the universal story, which is all you need to know really about that, which is story after story after story after story comes down to Rosebud. <laughs> okay? Like you just see his whole disastrous, horrific life was about that day that he was given up by his parents. Because what represented that was the sled which said Rosebud. So everything he did, all the, all the horrible nightmare of his political ambition and his cruelty to the guy who adopted him and screwing around on his wife, everything, everything, everything was done to overcome that corpse he was carrying around of, why did my mother give me away? And that's almost every story, over and over again. Any story of someone who was unhealed they're dragging that corpse around. So this is a story that Ernest told a lot, was that he would see that when people were neurotic, they were carrying around some corpse, some thing. So that's what he's talking about in this little seminar talk that he gave. We will have to learn that the man who lies drunk in the gutter and the man who prays in exaltation before the throne of his convictions, each in his separate star, is drawing the thing as he sees it for the God of things as they are. I haven't arrived, you haven't arrived. We are still carrying the corpses of our dead. Somebody stole from us, our parents were unkind to us. Somebody we loved fell in love with somebody else. If it is true that the man only who loses his life shall find it, he shall not find it at all until he has lost it all. That would be a morbid thing if we were thinking of physical death. It hasn't anything to do with anyone who's ever died, no matter what his conviction was. He just carried his conviction along with him. Everyone lives forever, and as Browning said, good will come at last as life to all. 
In my Father's house there are many mansions, said Jesus. We do not have to worry about the integrity of the universe. We do not have to tell God what to do. God has already done it for us, but we have failed to accept it because now we see as through a glass darkly. This is what sin is. It is the great mistake, the consciousness of separation, and we are trying to return to the Father's house. The father did not condemn the prodigal son. God does not argue. When the boy said, Dad, I want you to divide my portion, the father didn't say to him, Now wait a minute, son, I have only so much, and this is your share, and you mustn't go over to that place and gamble with it, for that is a bad place. The great value to the story is that the father didn't argue, and so the boy went out and spent his money and pawned all his clothes. He was a Jewish boy, and finally he got a job feeding the pigs, which is the worst thing that could happen to an Orthodox Jew, for they do not even eat pork. He would fain feed his belly upon the husks that the swine did eat, but no man gave unto him. No man ever gives but to himself. Life has made the gift, and we are to accept it the way it is made, and not some other way. There was that indelible memory, however, within the boy, and one day he sat down in the ruin of his life and remembered, as Wordsworth put it, that celestial palace from whence he came, and said to himself that he would go back, though he knew he wasn't worthy. The next great point of the story is that the father sees him afar off, the reciprocal action. Remember, this is a major part of science of mind, the reciprocal action of the universe. Ooh, that was good. People went, oh, what? Are you kidding me? Now you want to look it up, don't you? It comes to us as we go to it, but we have to leave the pig pen. We have to give up the sense of separation, nor can we carry the consciousness of union other than to inclusion. The boy then threw himself down and said, Father, I am no longer worthy to be thy son. Make me thy hired hand. But God didn't even know that he was dirty. Get that? A Course in Miracles says, God does not forgive because God has never condemned. He says, I don't forgive, but I don't see the sin. I don't see the dirt. Right? I don't see the heart problem. I don't see the illness. I don't see the poverty. I don't see it. You need to forgive it because you've condemned yourself. I just see my perfect son in whom I am well pleased. He just told the boy that he was very glad to see him and took him in and gave him the seamless robe and the father brought everyone together and they had a big party. What is the meaning of this, the greatest of all parables? Adela Rogers St. John's, the writer, said to me recently that it is the greatest story ever told because it has the most human drama in it. It is the greatest spiritual lesson Jesus taught. Why do we not realize that the father advanced to meet the boy and didn't condemn him? The judgment was gone. Now here's the good part. The boy that stayed at home and thought he was good had to get rid of his corpse too. Right? You know that part of the story. The son who was good, he was a good boy. He was spiritual and religious and did everything the father wanted the whole time. And here the other son went out and squandered everything on harlots and gambling. And when he comes back, the father runs out to meet him, the reciprocal action. He doesn't even wait for him to get to the house. He runs out to meet him and gives him this seamless garment and a ring and a party. And the brother at home is like, I'm so happy for you. <laughs> that is really great. <laughs> that you got a party after you went and did everything wrong and I've been here with him <laughs> the whole time. And the boy that stayed at home and thought he was a good boy had to get rid of his corpse too. He had left the father's house but didn't know it. He had never had a party, and when he complained about it, the father said, well, heaven knows there's plenty of here to have it with. Do you get that? Nature turns to us as we turn to it, but we have to turn clean. Are you and I carrying corpses? We all are. He's saying, you had everything here to have a party every day and never had one. 
Whose responsibility is your party? So I'm asking you. A Course in Miracles says it is your responsibility to make yourself joyful. Joy is in you. If you're not joyful, it's because you are not making yourself joyful. So years ago, I turned my life into a fucking party. Right? I said, I started saying this years ago, probably a decade ago, I started saying, and I was, it's so funny because I was living, I had given up everything. This is what he's saying in this earlier section where he said, you have to let it all go. So it's letting go of your whole story, the whole story that you're telling yourself that's all these corpses you're dragging around, of how you think things are supposed to be and what it's supposed to be like and where you thought you'd be and blah, blah, blah. And most of what you're doing that's all for the wrong reasons anyhow because you're trying to still make it in somebody else's eyes. You're still trying to have what you're supposed to have according to da-da-da-da. And your you know, parents are saying, do you think you're ever going to get married? Do you, think, like, do you think you'll ever settle on one job? You're not moving again, are you? What's wrong? Why are you? Right? All the things you're doing for somebody else that have nothing to do with you. Right? And you start to let all of that go. All of the things that you thought you were supposed to do or be or have that really weren't your choice, but you never asked you. So many people have babies because they think they're supposed to, and then they're like, oh my God. 18 years of this. I guess I'm happy. <laughs> I mean, there are people who authentically want children and people who've just been hypnotized into it from birth because we're hypnotized from birth. We're starting to tell stories from, that's not even true, before birth, because they're now talking to the belly. Oh, we can't wait for you to come and meet our needs. <laughs> so, <laughs> We're so sick of each other, we'd like someone else to focus on. So... <laughs> So, oh my God. So you start, so I just decided at that point that I was miserable teaching because I was doing a lot of things that I did not want to do. There were things that I thought you had to do as a spiritual teacher, and I hated a lot of them, and I didn't want to do them. And so for a while, I just was on the fence of, I'm just not going to teach anymore because I don't want to do, I don't want to hug everybody, and I don't want to talk to everybody and hear their fucking story. <laughs> you spend 90 minutes lifting people up, 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 away from the appearances of their problems that they've manufactured and they're in this wonderful, lovely place, and then you do a prayer, and then you're walking out, and they say, oh, Jay, could I have a hug? And you give them a hug, and they go, you know, my cat just died, and I really needed to be here today. And they just wipe the whole fucking thing out. They've gone right back into their story again. It's like you just waste, I just wasted 90 minutes of my life driving 100 fucking miles here to Kelly lift you up. Then you went right back into your stupid story again. <laughs> so, so I thought, I don't have the right personality for this kind of work. <laughs> <laughs> so then at a certain point I just decided I'm just going to do it my way I, I was living here in San Diego and I said I'm just going to move back to LA where I want to be I'm going to move into a little studio I was 45 years old I'm going to move into a little studio apartment and just get a secretarial job and at that point I was lecturing on Sunday mornings at a really dumpy room in Park Manor Suites I loved that room because it was like no frills. And I told people, this is how we're doing this. There's no hugging. There's no talking to me. <laughs> Can't talk to me. It's not a 
$15 suggested donation anymore. You're going to pay $15 or you can't come because I don't want to hear your story about all oh, Because I know everybody has the money. <laughs> so I said, $15 at the door does not make me your bitch. For $15, you get a prayer, a talk, and a prayer, and then I don't want to see anything at the end but your ass going that way. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> there was more, but that's enough for right today. <laughs> like that. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay, so, <laughs> so I said, and I'll just do it for fun, like I did in the beginning. And whatever I make, I make, but I'll get a secretarial job, and I'll do this, and I was like, and, I'm not, and at that time, I was at Pacific Church, and they'd been making the CDs, and we had people who were subscribing and stuff like that, and I don't know, it was maybe $7 a CD, $5, does anybody know? It was like, I, five, okay, listen to this, it was $5 a CD, then I would only get half of that, so I was getting 250C, but the ones that were being mailed out, then we were taking out for postage and the mailers and all of that, so then I'm getting like next to nothing. So I was like, fuck you. <laughs> you asked me to come, so you're getting what you get. <laughs> I didn't ask to come here, you kept writing me to come. Okay. <laughs> oh, please come. So. <laughs> They're trying to hold a high watch. <laughs> so hard. <laughs> so, so I was like, I, so I was like, here's the deal. I will, because there was a woman in Florida who was like, you can't stop, because I was like, I'm not going to record them anymore, because this is not, I'm doing, not doing this for a living anymore. And she just had a cow. And she was like, I have to have them. She said, you have to record them. I don't care how you do it. I'll da da da. Well, she ended up buying a, a duplicating machine for us, and I, that was right when those little MP3 things came out, so I said, okay, I'm gonna do it, but you don't get to say anything about the quality of them, or if they cut off, or anything like that. I'm gonna do it, and that's it. And here's the thing, I'm not selling shit. So, if somebody makes a donation of $25, I will send you a recording of the talk as my thank you gift. But you're not buying anything, and I was like, nobody is going to give $25 for a recording. You can buy a Madonna CD for less than $25. They're not going to pay $25 for, like, me on a fucking squeaky MP3. <laughs> but this woman insisted, we'll have a couple of those, and that's fine. Well, that's 90% of my living now. Because I completely gave away all of my story about how you run a business. This is not a business. This is my calling. I was called to do this. I've tried to quit it a million times. Jesus won't leave me the fuck alone. Okay. <laughs> so I just say, I'll do it, but here's the thing. They're not allowed to hug me, and it's, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't fart for less than $25 now. I practically starved to death doing this for you. Now, here's how we're doing it from now on, or I'm not doing it. <laughs> well, you know, all that is then is speaking your word. Strongly. <laughs> oh, my God. So I'm ready to start the talk. Is that okay? <laughs> <I'm kidding>. <laughs> 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 no, I will wrap this up now. So, at that point, one of the things, as I sat down and said, here's what I'm willing to do, because my life now, because the reason I did that was I was depressed. And I knew the first thing to do was to stop doing things that were making me unhappy. Duh. Who knew? <laughs> Maybe if I stop doing the things that are making me unhappy, that might help a lot with my happiness. So, you know, most people who get to that point do just leave. That's why so many ministers leave. 
and retire after 10 years or so is because they get burned out and they think, well, I have to do all this stuff I don't want to do. They're like, I just want to give the talk, but they have to have board meetings, they have to counsel people, they have to do all this stuff, and they go, God, this is a nightmare. If you don't have the personality to do that, right? So because I wasn't part of any organization, I was able to do that. So I just started eliminating the parts of my life that I didn't like doing. It did, it's not something you could do overnight. It was gradual. I dropped this thing and this thing, and there were agreements I had to complete with people in places, so it took time, right? But then I moved to the studio apartment, and I said, I'm gonna do what makes me happy, because guess what? No one's been assigned to you. No one's coming to make you happy. No one's coming. <laughs> and whoever's here is not it. It's your job. It's your job to make you happy. When you get up every morning, it's your job to make you happy. That's your job. Nobody else is here to make you happy. So I started eliminating the things that were making me unhappy, and I started adding the things that were making me happy. And one of the foremost things there was, and I don't even know where this came from, but I was like, I'm going to live like the Italians. Now you have to understand, I'd never been to Italy in my life. This was just a story in my head of what I projected to be how the Italians lived. So to me, that was like, I'm going to have fresh flowers. I'm going to take a nap every day. I'm going to go out to lunch. I'm going to have some wine. I'm going to, all of the things that to me were about that fantasy that I had in my life. I have no idea if that was real. But that's been something that's been there in these notebooks that I carry around and read all the time for years. So that then, over a year and a half ago, when my friend John came to me and said, he took me out to lunch and he said, um, first of all, he said, so I know I'm not winding down. I'm so sorry. I'm just so sorry. I really am so sorry. I am so sorry. They don't. <laughs> There's no hook anymore, so they just turn off your mic. If the orchestra was here, they'd play me off, but they just stop you like that. When, in that time when I was filling in for Marianne Williamson in LA, one of the reasons that I would fill in for her is she would go for a month every year to London. And so in 2012, I thought, oh, what if somebody who knows that I'm filling in for Marianne in London got interested, saw my website, jacobglass.com and said, oh, we'd like to have Jake Glass come to London. I thought, I would not have a passport if they needed me to come here. So I got a passport. No plans to go anywhere, because I've been on a plane a million years, and I'm not curious about anywhere. No curiosity about anything outside of Southern California. Again, waited my whole life to get here. When you find what you're searching for, sit the fuck down and shut up. <laughs> so my friend John took me out to lunch one day, and the first thing he said was, do you have a passport? And I said, oddly enough, I do. <laughs> and he said, I was meditating, and Spirit told me to take you to Italy. And I was like, it's strange, because he could have said any place else in the entire world, and I would probably not have been the slightest bit interested. And then he took it further and said, and I'm thinking about Venice for Carnival. I was like, well, that does sound intriguing. And he said, and I'm paying for everything. You'll have your own room. We're going business class. I'm paying for everything. All you have to do is bring your passport and show up. And I said, let me think about it. Yes. <laughs> but to me, that was the shift into, even after years of studying this stuff, of ultimately, and this is what I'll leave you with, is the greatest blockage to peace and joy is your own permission to have it. Is to give your own permission for you to be joyful. Because too many people think that there is something inherently wrong about being joyful. There's always people who are going to say, you can't be joyful because there's a war over here, and there's a this over here, and there's a that over there, and there's a this over there. And that's the same thing they said to Jesus. Exact same thing that they said to Jesus. Well, this is, of course, Judas saying this to Jesus, saying when um, the woman was, I think it was Mary or Martha, the sisters, 
I think it was Mary, who was washing Jesus' feet with her hair, the oil. And Judas said, why did you let her use that expensive oil on your feet? We could have sold that oil and given the money to the poor, right? Activism. Right? We got to get out there. We got to do it. We got to da, da, da. And Jesus said, you will always have the poor with you, but I will not always be with you. Jesus more or less went from party to party. <laughs> I'm going to this wedding over here. I'm going to a dinner party over there. I'm the, and he just healed people on the way. Right? A lot of his life was about enjoyment, about living in the now. And you have to give yourself permission. In A Course in Miracles, there's a whole section called The Obstacles to Peace. And it, says, it talks about how peace has to flow over these obstacles. It says the first obstacle to peace is the desire to get rid of it. That there's something wrong with feeling good. It's okay if it comes from a pill. But it can't come from I get up every morning and decide to start kissing my ass right away. <laughs> That's how I spend my life. I get up in the morning and I start to kiss my ass right away because I know nobody else is going to. So I look in the mirror and I go, hey, you handsome devil. Smarter and better looking every day, aren't you? God joyfully used this hunk of man meat. Right? Because let me just let you in on something. The suffering people of the world aren't saying, gee, I hope some stressed out angry person comes to help today. That would be awesome. <laughs> a hysterical, depressed savior is useless to the world. The world to be saved, and I'm not talking about the planet, I'm talking about the world, which is different. The world will be saved by happy, peaceful people, not angry people. <laughs> right? Thank you. Shut off the tape. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs>